Welcome to Brainish English Stories. Christopher had a great idea last night after pacing around his room for a long time. He decided to skip golf with his uncle and visit Catherine instead. Even if his uncle got upset, Christopher didn't care. He just wanted to see Catherine, even if he had to keep trying all afternoon. After making this decision, he felt peaceful and went to bed happily. He went to Hertford Street at three o'clock. She wasn't home. The doorkeeper told him she wasn't there when he asked where she lived. When will she come back? Christopher asked. The porter said he didn't know, and Christopher didn't like him. He left and walked in the park, getting wet from the rain. He came back at half past four, thinking she might be home for tea, but she wasn't. I'll go ask myself. Christopher decided, disliking the porter even more. The porter started to dislike Christopher too. There's only one way in, the porter said firmly. I would have seen her. Which floor? Christopher asked shortly. The first, the porter replied, even shorter. Christopher walked to the first floor flat in Hertford Street, feeling distant. He ignored the lift, which the porter hadn't suggested anyway because people usually took the tube. But she always went by tube. Christopher couldn't understand why anyone would enjoy tubes. He thought it wasn't possible. Instead of taking a taxi, he wondered why she chose to walk to the tube station from the elegant entrance hall of the flats. He wished she would take better care of herself, and wanted to protect her from harm. He hoped George felt the same way. He thought about Stephen, who he believed was a suitor, even if she forgot his name. Maybe she forgot because there were many suitors. He felt uneasy and rang the bell quickly, hoping to change the course of events. Mrs. Mitchum opened the door. They looked at each other for the first time. Christopher saw a respectable elderly person who looked like a nanny. Mrs. Mitchum saw a young man with innocent eyes, like a child at a birthday party. Will Mrs. Comfort be back soon? Christopher asked eagerly, matching the look in his eyes. I couldn't say, sir, Mrs. Mitchum replied. Looking at the eager young man, could I wait inside? Christopher asked. Mrs. Mitchum hesitated, but then relaxed a bit. Well, I'll have to wait downstairs if not, and I can't stand that porter. Mrs. Mitchum didn't like the porter either, and her face softened. Is Mrs. Comfort expecting you, sir? She asked. Yes, Christopher replied confidently, knowing she was expecting him the following Sunday. She usually tells me, Mrs. Mitchum began, but Christopher walked in promptly. As he handed her his hat and coat, Mrs. Mitchum hoped everything was okay. She thought she knew all her mistress's friends. And the young man had never been there before. She led him to the drawing room. What name should I tell Mrs. Comfort? She asked as they reached the door. He said, "Mr. Christopher Monkton." He replied absent-mindedly as he headed towards Catherine's room, where she likely spent most of her time, her special place. Mrs. Mitchum hesitated a bit. What if she had made a mistake by letting in a stranger, especially with the tea table set with poor Mister Comfort's silver spoons and sugar bowl?
Should she have asked the young man to wait in the hall instead? With doubt in her heart, Mrs. Mitchum opened the door and let him pass, keeping an eye on him as he went by. But he didn't seem like someone suspicious, she assured herself. She knew a gentleman when she saw one. Still, she left the door slightly open, just in case she needed to hear something. She walked back to her kitchen quietly, leaving the door open, and while she prepared bread and butter as silently as possible, she listened for any sign of her mistress returning. And even more carefully, she listened for anyone leaving the flat, just to be safe. But the young man in the drawing room didn't want to leave at all. He wanted to stay there forever. It was wonderful to have this time alone with her things before she showed up. It felt like reading the exciting introduction to a great book. Being here was almost as good as being with her. These things were like a part of her, just like the clothes she wore. They would tell him about her, give him a glimpse into her personality. But as soon as he looked around, he realized it wasn't her room at all. It was a man's room. It belonged to George. George was still present, with his big oak chairs and tables, huge oil paintings, and marble busts in the corners. Did people never really die? He wondered angrily. Was there no end to how they lingered on? George's essence seemed to live on in the furniture and decorations, reminding his widow of him. It seemed like she didn't want to forget him, or else she would have changed everything and surrounded herself with bright colors, flowers, and soft things that matched her personality. She seemed to have turned George into a saint, as people often do with difficult individuals once they've passed away. He stood there, looking around and convincing himself that he understood what had happened. Oh yes, he could picture it all. When George died, Catherine must have been overwhelmed with pity, grief, and maybe even some leftover love now that she wasn't obligated to feel it anymore. She must have clung to George's belongings, not allowing anything to be changed, moved, or altered. She was probably desperate to keep everything exactly as George had left it, as a way to keep him alive, at least in the things he owned. He had heard of other widows and widowers doing the same thing. He could understand it if someone loved another person very much or was deeply regretful for not loving them enough. But to continue like this year after year? Once you start, how do you ever stop? The only way to stop happily and naturally was to get married again. As he looked around, feeling impatient with George's lingering presence, he was fully expecting to find whiskey and cigars gathering dust on some table in a corner. Why not? They would fit right in with everything else. But then... He noticed a small white object on the heavy sofa near the fireplace, where the tiniest fire was flickering. It was a piece of her. Finally, he found a trace of her. He hurried over and grabbed it. It was soft, white, and carried the same sweet scent he had noticed when he was near her. It was a small fox fur the kind a woman wears around her neck. He quickly picked up the fur and pressed it against his face. It reminded him so much of her. He was completely engrossed in it, inhaling its delicate, 
sweet scent. Catherine, entering quietly with her key, saw him like this, standing over by the sofa with his back turned towards the door. She stood silently in the doorway, watching him with amused surprise. It seemed so amusing to her, really, to have this sort of thing happening with her fur at her age. What a strange young man. Maybe having all that fiery red hair made him, well, different. Even though he hadn't heard her, he sensed her presence and turned around quickly. He caught her amused expression and blushed deeply. Carefully, he placed the fur back on the sofa and walked over to her. Well, why shouldn't I? he said, lifting his head defiantly. She laughed, shook his hand, and said she was very glad he had come. She was so relaxed, so easygoing. She took everything as if it were completely normal, even things that were far from ordinary, like drying her shoes in the taxi the night before, or feeling the soft white fur against his face. He thought if she showed even a hint of shyness or self-consciousness, he would feel more in control, both of himself and of her. But she didn't. Not at all. There wasn't even a hint of surprise in her demeanor at seeing him. Yet, he had told her he could never get away on Saturdays. I just couldn't resist coming, he said, the redness still on his face. You didn't really expect me to wait until Sunday week, did you? I'm very glad you didn't, she said ringing the bell for tea and sitting down at the table, starting to take off her gloves. They were stuck because they were wet from the rain she had been out in. Let me help you with that, he said eagerly, watching her closely. She immediately held out her hands. You've been walking in the rain, he said, pulling at the soaked gloves with a reproachful tone. Then, looking down at her face, illuminated by the gray daylight of the March afternoon streaming in from the high windows, he noticed that she looked tired, completely exhausted, in fact. Concerned, he asked, What have you been doing? Doing? she repeated smiling at his intense gaze. Why, just hurrying home as fast as I could out of the rain. But why do you seem so tired? He persisted. She chuckled. Do I look tired? She asked. Well, I'm not at all. Then why do you look like you've walked hundreds of miles and haven't slept for weeks? I told you that you should see me in daylight, she said, amusement twinkling in her eyes as she observed his concerned expression. You've only seen me illuminated at night or in the dark. I looked just the same then, only you couldn't see me. Anyone can appear not tired if it's dark enough. That's silly, he remarked. You've been walking around and taking the tube. Look here, I wish you'd tell me something. I'll tell you anything, she offered. Her eyes were so kind, so incredibly kind, if only they weren't so weary. But you must sit down, she insisted. You're so tall that it strains my neck to have to look up at you. He sank into the chair beside her. What I want to know is, he began, leaning forward. He stopped as the door opened, and Mrs. Mitchum entered with the tea. Please continue, Catherine encouraged, unless it's something terribly indiscreet. <laughs>
Well, I was just going to ask you, do you like taking the tube? She chuckled. She seemed to always be laughing. No, she replied, pouring the tea. The teapot looked impressive. All the tea set up was impressive, except the part you ate. On that, there seemed to be a strict limit, with sparing butter on the bread and scant currants in the cake. Not that Christopher noticed any of this, as his attention was solely on Catherine, but later, as he reflected on the visit, he somehow sensed a curious difference between the tea arrangements and the picture frames. Then, why do you use them? He inquired, after Mrs. Mitchum had left and closed the door. Because they're inexpensive, she explained. In response, he scanned the room, imagining not just the room itself, but also Hertford Street and the nearby Park Lane, along with the reserved luxury of the entrance hall, and even the well-dressed, though personally disagreeable, porter. She followed his gaze. Tubes and all this, she remarked. Yes, I understand. They don't quite match, do they? Perhaps, she continued, I don't need to be so terribly careful, but I'm a bit nervous to start with. I'll probably know better after the first year. What first year? He inquired as she paused, but his attention was elsewhere because she had lifted her hands to remove her hat, and for the first time, he saw her without it dimming her appearance. He stared at her. She continued to talk, but he didn't hear a word. She had dark hair, swept away from her forehead, with tiny strands of silver woven into it. He noticed them. As he had sensed, as he somehow knew, she was older than him, but just a little, nothing significant just enough to make it fitting for him to admire her, for his place to be at her feet. He gazed at her forehead, so open, with a hint of gentleness, something remarkably good, comforting, and incredibly kind, yet with faint lines suggesting worry. And then her gray eyes, nicely spaced, very light gray with long, dark lashes, carried a sad look as if she had been crying. He hadn't noticed that before. At the theater, they had sparkled. He hoped she hadn't cried and wasn't worried, and that her laughter now wasn't just for show, for him, the visitor. She abruptly stopped talking, realizing he wasn't paying attention and was staring at her with great seriousness. Her expression shifted to amusement. Why are you looking at me so seriously? She asked. Because I'm terribly afraid you've been crying. Crying, she mused. Why would I have been crying? I don't know. How would I know? I don't know anything. He leaned in and gently touched her sleeve. He couldn't help it. He hoped she hadn't noticed. Tell me some things, he said. I have been telling you, and you didn't listen, she said. Because I was looking at you. You know, I've never seen you once in my life before without your hat. Never once in your life before, she repeated, smiling, as if you had been seeing me since your cradle. I've always known you, he said seriously, and at this, she quickly offered him some cake, which he ignored. In my dreams, he continued, gazing at her with eyes that, she feared,
were a little, well, not those of an ordinary caller. Oh, dreams. My dear Mr. Monkton, do, she said, waving away intangibles, have some more tea. You must call me Chris. But why? Because we've known each other always. Because we're going to know each other always. Because I, because I. Well, but, you know, we haven't, she interrupted, because who could tell what her impulsive new friend might say next? Not really. Not outside make-believe. Not beyond the immortal hour. Can you see the cigarettes anywhere? Yes, there they are. Over there on that table. Will you get them? He got up and fetched them. You've no idea how lonely I am, he said, putting them down near her. Are you? I'm very sorry. But are you really? I should imagine you with heaps and heaps of friends. You're so, so, she hesitated. So warm-hearted, she finished, and couldn't help smiling as she said it, for he was apparently very warm-hearted indeed. His heart, like his hair, seemed incandescent. Heaps and heaps of friends don't make one less lonely as long as one hasn't got, well, the one person. No, I won't smoke. Who is Stephen? How sudden. She couldn't keep up with this speed. Stephen? She repeated, a little bewildered. Then she remembered, and her face again brimmed with amusement. Oh, yes. You thought I was going to take him to the zoo tomorrow, she said. The zoo. Why, he's preaching tomorrow evening at St. Paul's. You'd better go and listen. He caught hold of her hands. You must tell me one thing, he said. You must. I told you I'll tell you anything, she said, pulling her hands away. Is Stephen, are you? You're not going to marry Stephen? For a moment, she stared at him in deep surprise. Then she burst into laughter and laughed and laughed till her eyes really did cry. Oh, my dear boy. Oh, my dear, dear boy, she laughed, wiping her eyes while he sat and watched her. And at that moment, Mrs. Mitchum appeared at the door and announced two ladies. Their miserable names sounded like Fanshawe and two ladies, who might well be Fanshawe's, immediately swam in and enveloped Catherine in arms of enormous length, it seemed to him, kissing her effusively, how deeply he hated them, and exclaiming in incoherent twitters that they had come to carry her off, that the car was there, that they wouldn't take no, that Ned was waiting. Lord, what snakes! He went away at once. No good staying just to see her being clawed away by Fanshawe's to the waiting Ned. And who the devil was Ned? Yes, there he was, waiting right enough, sitting snugly in a Daimler that looked very new and expensive, while the porter, a changed man, hovered solicitously near. Ned needed every bit of the new Daimler and the fur rug and the hideously smart chauffeur to make up for the shape of his silly nose, thought Christopher, scornfully striding off down the street.